Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Straining with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in South Carolina. In the last projection series, we saw major heat increases and troubling signs of serious floods in store for this state. Let's see where we are with the updated projections. It's worth noting we're not going to get another update from the feds until at least 2028, so hopefully today's new information will help guide us until then. Here's the resources I'm going to use for this outlook. If you go to my website, AmericanResiliency.org, and go to the Resources tab, you'll see the original American Resiliency visualizations, the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer, and a direct link to the NCA5 report, where you can also access the NCA5 Atlas that I'll be using for some fine-grained information. The same publicly available data sets that power the NCA5 Atlas are what we use for the American Resiliency visualizations, which I really do recommend that you check out I think that one of their strengths is that they allow us to get a good look at the difference between conditions at 1.5 C, which is where we are now. You can see in this update from the Copernicus Institute that the last time the monthly global surface temperature was notably below 1.5 was in June of 2023. June of 24 came in at 1.5. July of 24 dipped right below the line at 1.48. We'll have the August figures soon. So it really is worth taking 1.5C quite seriously as where we are now. And the projections in the NCA5 for what we would expect to happen to our country at 1.5C are largely bearing out today. I think that one of the strengths of the American resiliency visualizations is that many of them let you look at the difference between where we are now at 1.5 and the next step, 2C. As you can see in this visualization, the difference is big and it's important to get ready. I think it's very reasonable to be thinking about how your home will change by 2C and I want you to be able to do your own research. I want you to be able to confirm everything I report without too much work, so check out that resources tab on the website. And please remember that in American Resiliency, we're using that fifth national climate assessment publicly available data and figures because they represent the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this document, and you deserve access to this important information. But as a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the National Climate Assessment. That's why you haven't heard about it, and that's why I founded American Resiliency, the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public. We run on your donations. Let's check out the heat coming to South Carolina first with the wet bulb risk tool, which lets us see how many more weeks of potentially dangerous heat are heading towards our homes as we move towards 2C. South Carolina, we do see a longer dangerous hot season heading to your state, a longer season where potentially dangerous to deadly temperature conditions are likely to persist during the summer. No county in South Carolina is looking to be spared an increase of at least one week of potentially dangerous heat conditions, with some counties, particularly along that Georgia border, looking at two additional weeks between now and 2C, where wet bulb temperature conditions may be present. Now I've moved over to AR's total heat map, which stacks up how many days over 95, 100, and 105 we expect to see as we approach 2C for each county. And we can see that that Hot season increase, when we put a number on it, is pretty long. As we look towards the Georgia border, we're talking about more than a month of additional days over 95. And even down here by the coasts, it's a lot. Around Charleston, we're expecting more than two additional weeks over 95. Across the state, the range of the heat increase duration is really not that big. Except down by the coasts, where you're maybe going to knock a couple of extra days off you're talking about a 20 to 35 day hot season extension. And that hot season extension is going to peak quite hot. I looked in the NCA5 Atlas for detailed information and it's a little clunky. I want you to see where you can get it from, but I'm just gonna read it off. Except by the coast, we expect one to two days over 105 within that hot season extension across the entire state of South Carolina. And there are quite a few additional days over 100 projected within that hot season extension across the center of the state. In Columbia, we're looking at 10 additional days over 100 alongside two over 105. And even closer to the mountains up by Greenville, we're still looking at three additional days over 100 projected within that hot season extension. In figure 2.11 from the NCA5, unfortunately, I can show you that we have an increase in hot nights to match that hot season extension with most of the state looking at about 40 additional nights over 70 
And you can see this tiny sliver of relief by the coast indicating an additional 20 nights over 70. That is a small area where we're expecting coastal nighttime cool down in South Carolina. Now, all that being said, I know South Carolina is not a place where people are afraid of the heat. In Columbia, where we're looking at that nearly two week heat extension over 100 degrees, we've already got a July average temperature of 95. So while no one's gonna like this projected heat up, it is important to note that it's a bigger change in duration than a change in heat intensity. Let's take a large view on the 105 map in the NCA5 Atlas. I want you to notice all of those red patches lighting up in Texas and then into the Southwest, particularly in Arizona and Southern California. In the Southwest there, we are looking at large increases in both heat duration and heat intensity, as well as a drought trend with some places adding a month of additional days over 105. So, you know, putting it frankly, many people in the professional climate space who tend to be from the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest, places with more temperate climates, they kind of write off the Southeast in part because many people who are used to more temperate climates, maybe they went to the South one time and they're pretty sure they would die of heat stroke in the South today. So, well, increasing heat in the Southeast is a serious challenge. It's not the same level of potentially life-threatening duration and intensity change and drought that we see in the Southwest. I think there's a tendency to underestimate the existing heat resilience in the region, as well as a cultural acceptance that life is not always comfortable. So in South Carolina, as in her neighboring states, I do think this is a heat duration and intensity increase where maybe we shouldn't freak out, maybe we should get ready. Tune up the grid, prepare for a need to change our behavior. People aren't gonna be able to work outside in the summer during the daytime. To keep going in this hotter climate, I think we need to plan on lower hot season productivity, maybe crank it up, plan on more cold season productivity. And let me say also, I wouldn't blame you if you're intimidated by this level of projected heat up, it is too much for my taste, but I'm not a Southerner and I shouldn't be telling you what's too hot. Now let's take a peek at winter changes and then we'll talk about water, including projected trends around precipitation, hurricanes, and sea level rise. So looking at changes in cold duration, also in figure 2.11, we can see that in South Carolina, there's kind of a climb in cold loss from the north to the south of the state. That's kind of correlated to where it's ever cold in South Carolina. So to the north there, where you've got that darker color, you're gonna lose a couple of weeks at or below freezing. But I think it's important that we look at your change in plant hardiness zones, your change in the lift in the winter lows. That's more information that's interesting for most of this state where we tend to already have such a mild winter. How much are the lows gonna change? Let's go to figure 11.3. So this is figure 11.3 from the NCA5, changes in plant hardiness zones. As you can see, it's enormous. I'm gonna move us to a SNP now, a side-by-side -side for South Carolina. And as we're looking at this in a side-by-side, -side, that's a big change towards the north of the state, especially right here in this emerging hot pocket. That area is really high change. Some areas are looking at a solid 10 degree lift in winter lows here in South Carolina. So if you had typical lows in the mid thirties, they're shifting towards the mid forties. And that is a big change in what you can overwinter. Down by the coast, you can see that red creeping in. We're seeing some 9A creeping up from Florida through Georgia right into South Carolina. A really true subtropical type winter, a very mild winter indeed. And that's a winter with opportunities there, an emerging true subtropical winter. Because I can certainly tell you the current subtropics are looking pretty messed up in the global projections for what's going to happen in a warming world. Anything we can onshore growing, we ought to do it. I'm moving us over to figure 210 from the 5th National Climate Assessment as we start thinking about growing things. Let's see how much water we're going to get. And it looks like across South Carolina, we're expecting to see statistically significant about 5% more rain as we approach 2C. In figure 212, another complex figure. Unfortunately, we can see there are signs of deluge type rains in South Carolina emerging here with worse deluges consistently across these sub-figures expected towards the mountains. Those rains projected to even out and stay a bit more normal as we approach the coast. Clear trend across all three sub-figures. But deluge in the mountains, that's not something any of us want to hear. 
We know that those driving flooding rains are particularly dangerous and deadly when you combine them with elevation. Northern South Carolina, South Carolina up towards the mountains, now it's looking quite serious, your level of change. You're stacking a major heat up, a big winter change, and a severe deluge threat. As you move towards the coast in South Carolina, the state's still high change. It's high change throughout, but it might be a bit of a smoother shift towards a potentially productive subtropical climate as you move towards the coast. Although we are at risk for hurricanes here, including these new dumb hurricanes that want to come in from the Gulf and then hang out over the southeast, dropping a ton of rain and flooding everyone. That was quite awful, I know, in South Carolina this year, the flooding from Tropical Storm Debbie. Serious property damage, serious infrastructure damage. And I'm sorry to say that as we look towards our best understanding of shifts in hurricane trends, we used to tend to see hurricanes move across Florida. That was not cool. Now we're seeing them move way inland and kind of cruise up the coast, really flooding the coastal cities of the Southeast on a regular basis. It's a consistent trend across models. We can't treat it as a fluke. And if you've experienced one of these tropical storm remnants dumping all that water, you know we're talking about volumes of water. We're dealing with it is a real challenge. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna put up a sandbag and I'm gonna be fine. It's a major resilience challenge. And that can be quite a compounding challenge near the coast where we've got serious concerns about sea level rise. You know, Charleston, I'm sure if you're there, you know Charleston's already struggling with changes to the water table. They've been flooding quite regularly in Charleston with every king tide now. And let's get over to the NOAA sea level rise viewer. This is a very powerful tool with great address specific level of information. And I'm gonna be modeling three feet of sea level rise, which is definitely a reasonable amount to be considering in our lifetimes, especially when you build in storm surge, right? And I'm gonna model 10 feet, which unfortunately it does look like higher end sea level rise is becoming a more and more serious possibility due to the extreme melting we're seeing around Antarctica these last couple of years. If you go to my channel page and search for Antarctica on the page, you'll find a video that brings together a number of high quality sources on that topic to help you understand why I really think it's worth revising our understanding towards higher end sea level rise. All right, so bird's eye view here. At three feet and at 10, we are talking about substantial land loss for South Carolina. I wanna zoom in the first place we're gonna look at is Myrtle Beach. And that's because I think you will be shocked at how pretty fine it looks at three feet. This is cool. At three feet, we are seeing water move inland. We are seeing marshiness emerge where we see this uh, green patches coming in pretty far inland. But the damage to the built environment is actually pretty small at three feet. And even these outlying keys, we still have some pretty good structure remaining in the outlying keys at three feet of sea level rise. Unfortunately, at 10 feet, we would lose them. We would lose them and we would see more serious damage to the built environment. I think that at 10 feet, we also are looking at a lot of potential for land loss through erosion with storms because you can see the water table is just getting so high here. There's just so much marshiness emerging inland. But this whole beautiful beach area, going back to three, from Huntington to Myrtle, it really looks so good at three, much better than I expected. If I loved this area, if I was some lucky person who had a little beach house in this area, I wouldn't be rushing to get rid of it. We are going to lose this area as we see higher end sea level rise, but it looks like a really stable, beautiful recreational place to continue to enjoy two, three feet. If I were a property owner here, I'd hold on for a while and keep building memories and enjoying life. The beach is up by New Jersey. We see big damage to the beaches and surrounding area there and even one foot of sea level rise. So you should know there are beach areas where I would advise people to pull out now, and that's not the case in this area. I think it's wonderful to see some hope for a place that I know many people have just some of their happiest times there. But as may not surprise you, this picture is less rosy down by Charleston. Let's go over there. So here's today around Charleston, and here's at three feet, we see substantial damage to the built environment, substantial inland marshiness occurring throughout the region. And at 10 feet, it's just a disaster. It just looks terrible. And well inland, well inland, we see very serious problems in the Charleston region in the event of higher end sea level rise. 
But even our expected, our lower end sea level rise at this point looks very difficult for this region. It's sad to see what a vulnerable area this is because Charleston is a beautiful city. There's a great food scene there. But if you're a generational thinker, this is not a coastal city where I would dig in. This outlook, this likely future is just too crazy and we're not looking at any good seawall possibilities either. I do wanna point out one more place in this tool. This modest community here, Andrews, a farming community, my kind of community right over by the slough there. I think it's fun to see that at 10 feet of sea level rise, they don't have any real damage to the built environment, but they do get new oceanfront property. Live in the dream. I feel like it is worth noting how far inland we're expecting open water to extend into this gentle sloping land in South Carolina here as we see higher end sea level rise emerge, especially because there is so much beautiful agricultural land that's going to be impacted by that where there's a real concern. Is that land going to take on salt? Are we going to get salt into the earth and into those water systems? I think it's worth building an awareness of this potential risk to this important agricultural land for the generationally minded. South Carolina, this is a challenging outlook. There's no mistaking it. That hot season increase, the duration is substantial, and we're looking at pushing the boundaries of normal heat intensity for this region, with many parts of the state projected to add a week over 100 every summer. In a humid area, that kind of heat can be injurious and deadly, even to healthy young adults, and it's especially dangerous to infants, the elderly, or people with heart and lung conditions. So you're talking about an increased public health risk from heat and a real need to build resilience, community resilience against heat. I do also anticipate that with this fairly high level of winter change towards the mountains, we won't see a lot of great landscape stability there. The changes may be the most painful in the north with a more gradual subtropical transition as you head to the coast, which that northern coast there up by Myrtle Beach is surprisingly nice to three feet, and the heat increase isn't as bad there, and the winter stability isn't terrible. I would call that part of South Carolina not a paradise for someone looking to dig in long term, but if you're trying to enjoy the next 10 years, I'd go for it. Like, if you want a coastal retirement that's not super expensive and not as high of risk as Florida's getting to be, that looks like a real option in South Carolina. The agricultural transition in this state is going to have to be big. It's going to need to move towards hot weather tolerant crops in a major way. When we look at the situation to the southwest, though, the national ag scene is going to change. A lot of your salad crops, your table crops, tomatoes, bell peppers, all of those things that our country right now grows in California, they're not going to have the water in California to keep the production up in the Central Valley. So for table crops that like it hot, Central to coastal South Carolina is a potential opportunity zone where outside of those tropical storm remnants, which are a serious threat, you aren't looking to see much deluge type rain as we're expecting to the west of you in the southeast. Alabama is looking to get pretty hard by deluge type rain. They have a bigger problem with that emerging than you do in South Carolina. Up towards the mountains in South Carolina, this looks like a very heavy lift in these projections. There you do have the deluge pattern, big winter change, big summer change, it's gonna be really bad for the trees. I would expect a terrible combination punch of fire and flood. There are other parts of greater Appalachia that are much more stable than we see in South Carolina as we get towards the mountains. I'm very sorry to give you bad news, but if you're facing an intimidating level of stacked risk, you should know about it if you're gonna dig in. You're gonna to need to dig in really hard. The kinds of flooding you're talking about facing are a community level problem. And it's not just from hurricane remnants, which will whap you, but year round, you will also expect to see regular precipitation get really intense. I'm sorry to say it. South Carolina, I'm wishing you all the best. I hope this video gave you the information you can use to prepare for what's coming. It's a big lift in this state, but there are opportunities as well as challenges. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for watching, and I want to thank everyone in the AR community for your contributions that are keeping this nonprofit going. If you want to donate, there's a link on the About page of our YouTube channel or on the top bar of our website, www.americanresiliency.org. I'm very grateful to our donors, to our volunteers, to everyone spreading the word online, and especially to everyone doing the work on the ground. 
Thanks for getting ready with me and talk with you again soon.